Thank you all for joining us. We're just waiting just a few minutes to make sure um, everyone has a chance to connect to this meeting before we get started. All right, I think I'm going to get us started. Um, hopefully everyone's been able to log in and you can all hear us okay. Um, my name is Anna Bertonzetti and I am the planning director for the city and county of Broomfield. And tonight's meeting is a community meeting regarding the Broomfield Town Square development. The purpose for tonight's meeting is really to present updated information regarding this project to some of the closest neighborhoods to the development site. And you may have heard this project called the Civic Center Development in the past, um, and the new name that we are utilizing is the Broomfield Town Square. So tonight's meeting, after my brief introduction and the review of the agenda, we'll be going over a quick background for the overall project, and then the development team will be providing a presentation regarding the current uh, status of the proposed development. And we'll finish tonight with the key portion of the agenda, which is really a question and answer portion where we want to have an opportunity for those in attendance to ask questions that you might have. Um, based on this agenda, we do believe that tonight's meeting will conclude around 730. And I just want to reiterate that there's no decisions made at tonight's meeting, and there will be additional opportunities in the future for um, continued participation regarding this project, including public hearings with both the Planning and Zoning Commission and the City Council as the proposal progresses through the development review. As I mentioned, this is just one step. It's an important step. This is um, important for the process because we are going to provide an opportunity for questions and answers. And we're providing additional information. And if you have questions after tonight's meeting, we also provide um, information on our website at broomfieldvoice.com. And we'll also be including a copy of this presentation um, and meeting at that site as well. At tonight's meeting during the Q&A session, if you're dialed in using your phone, you'll be using star nine, and that will virtually raise your hand so that we know you have a question. If you're joining us by the computer with the Zoom application, you can use the Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen to type in a question and comment, or you can also use the raise hand function to verbally indicate your question. If you have additional comments after the meeting, as I mentioned, we do have the Broomfield Voice page and we'll have additional information on that website as well. Um, with us on the call tonight, um, in addition to the development team, we have Lynn Merwin, Principal Planner, Kevin Stanbridge, the Deputy City and County Manager, um, Jennifer Hoffman, the City and County Manager. We were also joined by a few of our council members, um, Council Member Lim and Council Member Schaff, and there may be others joining us um, throughout the call tonight. So with that, I'd like to introduce Kevin Stanbridge, the Deputy City and County Manager, for a brief overview of the background for this project. Thank you, Anna. And it's a pleasure uh, to be able to share this information with everybody who's joined us this evening. Uh, this, uh, as I'm going to talk about, has been a long planned effort that is moving forward. Um, the thought of Broomfield Town Square or the Civic Center began back in 1995 with the adoption of an updated Broomfield Comprehensive Plan. It designated the area we're looking at now, which I should generally describe as the area, um, the old Safeway store north of 120th Avenue, 
uh, up to First Avenue. The area uh, along the east side of Main Street from First Avenue up to about the, uh, the drainage way where it goes through and over to the library. And that's what we know as the uh, uh, Broomfield Town Square and what we're talking about this evening. Uh, Broomfield purchased this land uh, to serve as a town square uh, in 1998. Uh, we actually purchased the property from Lutheran Hospital uh, who had um, bought the property uh, decades before with the intent of a satellite hospital. Um, we added, we bought this old Safeway store in 2015 uh, and have been uh, managing that property since. The Broomfield City Council approved a sub-area plan for the Broomfield Town Square or Center in 2007. That plan was prepared by a volunteer citizens group that was led by a consultant, uh, Dana Crawford. Many of you may know uh, Dana still is uh, peripherally involved in the project uh, and um, she and, and her consulting group and the volunteer uh, residents prepared the first sub-area plan for the Civic Center. In 2016, the City Council entertained proposals from development teams and selected uh, the team that you're gonna hear this evening. Um, community, that team when they were first uh, brought on board started with focus sessions which were conducted in January of 2017. Again, a group of about 30 volunteer residents from Broomfield. The focus sessions provided input from the volunteer uh, residents on guiding principles for design, what, land uses, what kind of activities uh, folks wanted to see, um, and design themes. Um, so talked a lot about outdoor spaces, the importance of trails and bicycle access, uh, the importance of public art in the entirety of the project, and a whole number of other considerations. In uh, November of 2019, uh, the City Council approved a development agreement with the Broomfield Town Square Alliance, again, the group with us this evening presenting. And then in May of this year, many of you may have seen, uh, a concept review was presented to the City Council and the community, and a number of um, uh, issues were identified and uh, during that concept review and um, everybody had an opportunity to get uh, a notion of the full span and spectrum of the project and everything that's included in it. So through all those efforts beginning um, over 25, about 25 years ago, this project has been incrementally moving forward. With that, I'd like to turn it over to, I believe, Chris Parizo from Civitas Design, who's gonna talk about the overall land plan. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for coming out tonight. So I'm going to walk you through just some um, basic sort of uh, land plan diagrams before we get into the site plan so you guys um, who aren't familiar can understand the site. Kevin, I'm sorry, maybe could have pointed to these while you were talking. So the future Safeway market Kevin was talking about, um, we are looking at a lot of the land north of um, First Avenue. Uh, even starting to look up into the drainage way as part of another project. But for the purpose of tonight, um, our concept is set on this sort of walkable uh, street and block network, creating a very dense sort of urban core and plaza at the center. We are looking at um, primarily uh, five-story buildings uh, in, the, in the middle and some three-story townhomes on the edge. And the land use makeup of this project is primarily uh, mixed-use residential buildings in this area, uh, some age target residential here, um, three-story townhomes on the west edge. Um, and of course, everyone is familiar with the lake and the libraries on this component. Um, part of the project also is um, this future market hall at the Safeway building, which Kevin talked about. So on the left here, um, we did take a hard look at the existing trails and, and bike network, uh, the left in the middle diagram. So we are trying to stitch all um, future ped walks um, and shared bike facilities into that network. Um, so of note is this primary regional connection um, to the north of our site. So we do allow bikes in the core of our development uh, on the edge of Main Street um, and also sort of a robust network of um, sidewalks connecting to existing and future streets. And we are working closely with uh, the development team and the architects about how um, our future parking garages will be accessed and understand circulation for vehicles around the site. Uh, 
as well. So some primary component, components of the site development plan, um, just to orient you, um, north is up, First Avenue is here, Main Street is on this edge here. Uh, letter A is our central market, which is the redeveloped uh, Broomfield. Um, B and C represent sort of what we're calling the Broomfield stairs that bring us down to our primary main um, Broomfield Town Square, which is uh, just under a half acre um, flexible mixed use um, town square environment, flanked by the residential buildings on either side with ground floor retail, um, age targeted retail, which I showed you in the diagram. Uh, most people are familiar with this, this large lake in the middle. Uh, we are exploring the idea of a, a boathouse or small shops sort of on the pier on the lake. This edge having sort of a beach and lawn environment, um, just immediately as you come in from the neighborhood to the west, you would sort of walk into this lawn, uh, slope beach area. Existing tennis courts and park to the north, uh, generally to remain as is today. Um, the north shore of the lake, uh, as we're calling it now, um, some sort of a boardwalk so you can wrap all the way around the lake. We are looking at the uh, existing amphitheater as it is today would remain. Um, the 9-11 memorial over on this edge uh, to remain as is, and of course the pond uh, over here. So those are primary elements um, of the site. So a few renderings just to share with you guys that are really interesting. Everyone's got to study this a little bit from the beginning, um, but these are showing our uh, five four to five story mixed use buildings on either side of the plaza. Um, this view is taken from sort of above the safe, Safeway, so you do see sort of our staircase coming down, which will also include uh, ADA ramp. Uh, scaling of this street to be a little bit uh, more smaller, a little more safe pedestrian crossing. Uh, next rendering, uh, just taking us down into the plaza, so we are sort of sitting on these terrace steps looking to the north. Uh, you can see, see sort of the lake uh, poking into the plaza. Mixed use retail on the lower edges of these buildings. Uh, the orange umbrellas represent sort of our outdoor um, seating area. Uh, plenty of space in the middle of this plaza, uh, intentionally designed um, to be grand and flexible. So there could be fountain um, on, on most days for uh, children uh, or anyone to play in. Uh, that could be turned off for farmers markets or um, concerts or um, any sort of community event that we like in that plaza. Um, and we are sort of thinking of framing this up above with a catenary system about 25 feet up to sort of just uh, light that plaza with a nice soft glow. And then uh, another view, um, looking for looking um, south from sort of the lake edge. Um, the lake edge is proposed to have these uh, terrace steps on the edge. Um, some nice lush plantings um, separating the lake edge from a walk. You can see on this edge, um, storefronts and seating zones. Looking back into the plaza, just to give you a sense of scale. Um, and then Tim's gonna walk you through a little bit more of these buildings, but um, paying special attention to sort of the design of the facades and the corners of these buildings about how they relate um, to each of, um, uh, each of the plaza spaces. And then the last thing to point out on this is um, heading west between the two multifamily buildings here is sort of a 50 foot wide paseo that will eventually connect up um, through the development and out to the Main Street uh, multi-use trail. Thanks, Chris. Uh, again, I'm Tim Frederick with Millinder White and I am assisting on um, development and construction on this project. I want to give you a brief tour of the different buildings we have within the site plan that Chris just toured you around. Um, beginning at the north, you can see the beach there on the right hand uh, side of your screen. Um, so this is sort of the northern extent of the you know, major improvements of the project, like extending to the east and northeast. Um, the first buildings you will see on the side are uh, an age restricted uh, housing project, 55 plus for rent. Um, these uh, communities benefit um, town squares and, and central um, central urban areas because they activate space at times when other folks are off at day jobs. So um, th this building in particular will have um, up to 160 units and it uh, again will serve to activate the retail around our town square. It is five stories tall and immediately west of this building is a row of for sale three-story townhomes. I'll show you some renderings in a little bit about how those um, sort of screen the view of uh, the taller building immediately to your east. 
uh, again, immediately to the north of there is the beach and wrapping the east side of the age targeted building is a boardwalk per se that wraps the edge of the lake, has seating areas around the lake. And additionally, um, we have a pier and boathouse area where we, you know, in, our intention is to have boat rentals, um, paddle boats, and uh, potentially a small retail presence there, such as an ice cream stand. Maybe you can grab a cup of coffee, something of that nature, but just playing into the kind of the lo uh, lake theme sort of a, a uh, concession, lake concession stand, if you will. Pretty light, it might be seasonal. Uh, Chris, if you could tab to the next slide. Uh, we just, this is a depiction of looking at the building from the lake side. So it, it steps uh, from sort of a four story elevation with some rooftop amenities, um, the lobby and uh, con general congregating area will be on the ground floor, so down in that two-story wood element you see there and even wrapping the corner to the left side of the screen will be activated space, demo kitchen, um, large fireplace, two-story kind of clear score, clear story effect, um, but not, you know, live uh, units immediately facing the boathouse, but making it more of an activated space towards the, the more public facing uh, side of this building. Next slide, please. Moving to our south, uh, you're seeing the intersection of Main and First Street. And fronting that corner is a four-story mixed-use building. And we will show you some um, renderings of how that might uh, look here in a second. But it is a wrapped building. So you have uh, structured parking within the building. Uh, and that will actually be open to the public. There's also passageway, a passageway from the uh, open parking to the plaza. So if you're, um, you know, there, we've heard a lot of comments about, we wanna make sure this isn't a sea of surface parking, you know, Broomfield's already over parked. Any of the parking that we're bringing to this site is wrapped within these buildings. So it's, it's tucked out of view. Um, it's not um, in general impacting the aesthetics of the general town square area. And again, um, these, these parking spaces will be open to the public uh, and they have direct uh, connection to the plaza. Uh, again, four-story building. This is for rent residential. On the south side of this building is amenity, you know, mail room, uh, entry lobby type amenity. On the east side, in, depicted in red, is some of the first shops you'll see within this project that are, are um, you know, the core of, of what the town square is. So we envision these being generally fairly smaller um, shops, you know, not, not looking at on average, you know, four or 5,000 square foot spaces. These are, these are a bit smaller catering to local retail. Um, though we do think the corners of this building would be well served with some larger format full service restaurant, particularly that Northeast corner, looking out Northeast over the lake. Um, you know, we envisioned, you know, art and an activated plaza. So you, the, you know, people watching across the plaza and vice versa. If you're in the plaza, you're, you're gonna see outdoor dining immediately outside of this space and all of these spaces for that. Um, so again, the, the general mission is to activate this plaza and make it a place for the community and, and not kind of turn inwards and just have this be a place just for the residents. Uh, next slide, please. Excuse me, residents of the buildings within the site. Uh, this is just the west elevation of that building we were just looking at. Again, it's a four story building. Um, we've taken a lot of care to decrease the scale um, and feel of the building. So you'll notice that the top story is set back. Um, you know, we're talking darker hues of colors and setting that top story back. So we'll have the general feeling of, of a smaller scale. And we have some, some street views that we'll show you a bit later and we can touch on, on that a little bit later. Uh, moving further south, this is the repurposed Safeway building. This is uh, another really, really exciting component of the project. And one of the most commented on um, pieces of the project, what, what folks are mo most excited about. Uh, this building, um, the Safeway building will be repurposed. It will be divided into two buildings. So you can see on the left side of your screen, a green um, shaded 
paseo through this area. So this will have, well, this will introduce direct connectivity between the residents to the south and to the north, drawing residents through this repurposed Safeway building down a central grand staircase and down into the plaza, perched up above when at the elevation of the Safeway building, we envision, envision it at a kind of general public, uh, we call it the ship's prow, um, but it's, it's like the bow of a boat. It's, it's almost a pier where you can stand and you're, you're elevated up over a story above the uh, plaza below. So uh, tremendous views looking northeast over the lake and as well as over the plaza. So we want this plaza to be activated. We envision bands, uh, movie nights, farmers markets, you name it, any type of festival or event. We envision this, this little pier perched up above the Safeway, as well as the stairs themselves to be utilized by the public. You can imagine tiered seating on those stairs as you're watching an event happen in the plaza below. On the right side of the um, detailed Safeway building plan there, you'll notice um, it's broken into a lot of smaller spaces. Again, we're targeting smaller local businesses. And with that, we've taken care to break this building building down. Um, the smaller spaces cater to lower rents and uh, this will be in the fashion of a market hall uh, with a central seating and bar area wrapped with both food uh, retailers and um, soft goods and, and general retail. So we envision some kiosks as well scattered throughout. So picture, you know, gift cards, flowers, um, tacos, you know, all the smell sights and sounds you want in inside of a marketplace. Our partnership with City Street Investors, we'll let Joe speak um, here. Maybe even Joe, if you want to chime in now about how you envision this place living and breathing and evolving over time with that, with, with the recent um, COVID-19 outbreak. And maybe tell a little bit about your experience uh, at Union Station and how you've, you've activated these spaces historically. Thanks, Tim, and uh, uh, thanks everyone for joining tonight. Yeah, the, the, I think the Safeway uh, building presents an opportunity for us to really fulfill um, the desires, uh, the wants, the needs that came out of the focus group that worked that we did a couple of years ago for this community, uh, which was, uh, you know, just really, really want to see places for local merchants um, to be able to be in business in Broomfield. And what we're able to do here is to create um, small, affordable spaces where uh, the cost of entry is very low. It allows entrepreneurs to, you know, come in and and try their hand at retail or food and beverage, and um, you know, create a, a really a compelling mix of local stuff that's special for Broomfield, as opposed to a lot of the usual suspects you might see in a you know conventional strip shopping center. And so I don't want anyone thinking of this space right now as a food hall. We call it a market hall with purpose, which is that we envision it to be just that, a market. Almost like a, you know, the traditional uh, bazaar or market of the old days where there was, uh, you know, a lot going on in, in a relatively dense space with lots and lots of small uh, merchants uh, food and beverage op offerings, places to sit, uh, places to read a book, get a cup of coffee, drink, shop, buy local goods. So this this space is key to the to uh, meeting the the goals that came out of the uh, out of the focus group. So I think we've got an exciting plan for it here. It was totally informed by the focus groups. It really is really a manifestation of the of, of what came out of that, and um, I think it will will be able to really rather than have you know, four or five tenants, this is a place where, you know, we might ultimately be able to have 15 or 20 different uh, offerings, maybe even more, depending on how we finally merchandise it. But, you know, Tim had mentioned, you know, what about, you know, what about COVID? I think timing on this project is in our community, in our favor, in our community's favor, because it's still a couple of years out from realization. And so we can use this time to do our planning, to do our uh, engineering, our architecture, our design, uh, our financing really get get all of our ducks in a row so that uh, by the time we really undertake uh, 
construction were, were you know, some, some ways uh, down the road and hopefully getting back to uh, uh, some normalcy. But um, uh, I think we, we have been very, per very careful in, in making sure that we're able to create spaces for local merchants to be able to operate um, at a cost effective level and both here in the old Safeway building as well as uh, across the street. So, um, you know, with that, Tim, I'll turn it back over to you and I'm sure we'll have time for some questions and answers uh, uh, as we continue through this. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, I'm sure you'll have some. It, again, is a pretty exciting component. And, and again, a lot of the questions that are coming in from the local community have been centered around this building. What will it be? How will it evolve? Um, on the left side of the building, um, I hadn't mentioned yet that uh, we have a large amount of office space in this building. At this point, we do believe that is still a co-working um, establishment. We, we don't have a brand circle or identified or a partner for that space yet. Uh, we do think uh, post-COVID uh, co-working or creative office uh, comes out the other side actually as a pretty attractive um, type of office occupancy for folks. Uh, because it does offer the flexibility that you know the next generation is looking for, as well as a lower price point and flexibility for corporations so, and companies. So again, um, we we also within this building, I should mention, there's a smaller event space. It's labeled number five on your screen. It'll be shared between the co-working, uh, the space labeled number seven, which is immediately to the north, which is imagined to be a uh, food and beverage establishment with views out over the lake, uh, with the flex um, event space in between that can be utilized by the food and beverage, utilized by the office, and opened up to the community at large so we can have small speaking events, et cetera. Again, all flowing out into this Paseo that flows through the former Safeway building and pulls people towards the north and the core of the town square. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so uh, you can see a, a better perspective here of what I'm talking about. This. This uh, Safeway building does get cut in two. Uh, we do, uh, in our latest plans, have um, this jewel type feature within the east side of the Safeway building. You can see it popping up a little bit higher above the existing roof elevation. This is just creates some volume within the building. We've got a great architectural group on board for this space. They're very, very creative. And um, when viewed you know, from the interior in their three-dimensional architectural models, it's, it's pretty compelling, pretty exciting. And uh, we'll continue to flesh that out with time. Uh, next slide, please. Zooming down and into the space, uh, we do hope to preserve the existing steel girders and joists that are the current framing of the Safeway building. These structural members offer tremendous opportunity to create a special place through this pedestrian Paseo. So we envision different colors of paint, uh, art, seasonal art hanging from this feature, but um, really doing something creative. These that won't just be like gray painted joists. Um, this will be something that again, will change with time and most definitely will involve art in some capacity. We'll let the artists um, work on that with time, but uh, we do wish to preserve that structural framing and kind of pulls you through and offers an interesting, you know, kind of false lid over the space. We'll also uh, have, you know, live vegetation through here as well to pull, pull life into um, a former, formerly inanimate Safeway building. Next slide, please. All right. Now um, we have a series of images here, which are, you know, less detailed than some of the, um, well, less pretty than some of the, uh, the, you know, proper renderings we've produced for the project, which show, you know, the, the, the baby and the stroller going down the street with their, their parents to, to go get the ice cream. But they do, they, what they are meant to do is communicate to you the scale and the types of uses um, within the project as viewed from the general first filing vicinity and the areas surrounding First and Main Street, which is where we believe most um, residents will be pulling um, into and, and into the project. So this is a view looking north. Uh, the lower right hand corner of your screen will show you approximately the uh, direction that this view is looking. Again, you're looking approximately from first and main north. Uh, Chris mentioned the three-story townhomes earlier. Those are depicted in white further to the north. These have not been designed yet. That's why there's no color there. Uh, these are place, this is placeholder imagery. Uh, this is 
we believe, you know, in line with the architectural intent of, of what these maybe should be, maybe not so much ultra modern flat roof type of, of, you know, rooftop deck townhomes, but, but maybe these are, you know, more of a farmhouse style gabled roof, uh, three-story townhomes tuck under parking behind. So all of these, all of these units will have garages. And again, there's 12 of those there. There's an alley between those townhomes and the uh, apartment building immediately to the right. Uh, but the next building to the south, as you can see, is the four-story apartment building and efforts we've made to reduce the, the, the effect of the scale of that building. The trees you're seeing um, are, you know, existing trees and, 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 and uh, as well as additional landscaping that we propose within the project. So this isn't like hypothetical, uh, you know, fast forward 20 years. Um, anybody traveling Main Street knows there, you know, there is some um, good existing foliage and uh, as well as on First Street. So we're going to do our best to really capitalize on, on that amenity and use it to our advantage to make this feel like a, a, a soft place. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, again, just another perspective of, of the three-story townhomes showing you the scale as well as the screening of the five-story building beyond. Um, this view as you can see is, is taken from um, you know, immediately west of the sidewalk on with the western sidewalk on Main Street. So this is uh, about as close as you can get to the project um, without being inside the boundary of the project. We are quite a ways um, from face to face uh, from those townhomes and the western building to the homes to the west. And, and, and we can touch on those metrics in a little bit. We'll give you a little bit more data on exactly, um, you know, those right, the setbacks from the right away and uh, the setbacks from the first filing community. Next slide, please. Uh, one more view of the same area, looking south this time. So this is viewed from closer to Second Avenue, looking, looking south across the project. You can see the five-story building on the left side of the screen, the three-story townhomes or towards the central, and then the four-story apartment building is, is off in the distance. Next slide, please. Uh, and then this is, again, closer, closer to Second Avenue, looking due east here. And uh, if you could um, kind of rise up in elevation, just a few more feet, you'd see the beach there. Uh, so something we're pretty excited about is the fact that the residents of this, this neighborhood are going to have a beach, um, a public beach at their fingertips with you know, a water with very high quality uh, water. So this will be swimmable, will be clean, it will be healthy, um, probably will not be allowing dogs on that beach for safety and health reasons. Um, and again, the boathouse would be straight down the middle of your screen if you could see a little bit further through those trees. You'd have a, a boathouse right over in that area. And uh, you can see the, the softening of the five-story building. It steps to four stories on this side and has a cool uh, rooftop amenity for those uh, age-targeted age residents. So they have evening views uh, out over the lake. Maybe they'll, um, you know, maybe they'll have uh, a glass of wine up there and watch the sunset, potentially some mountain views, which would be terrific. Next slide, please. All right, uh, sh shadow study here. Uh, you can see here that this is, uh, at the bottom of the screen, this is identified as the summer solstice. And we just wanted to portray, you know, what the effect of primarily the four-story building would have on the residents immediately west of this community. Uh, so this is uh, the longest shadow you, you should experience. Um, and you can see sometime between 6 a.m. and 7 a.m. That, that shadow goes no further than the, the back of the curb uh, of Main Street. So it's, uh, this won't be, you know, creating a shadow that's cast until 10 a.m., 11 a.m. Uh, again, it's, uh, this is more somewhere around maybe 6.30 a.m. by the time um, any homes would have any impact of, of, a, of a shadow from this building. And we can come back to this if anybody has any questions about the shadow studies. We can, we're happy to jump back to the slide and revisit it. And closing the loop, um, we just wanted to give you uh, one last high level look of the site so you could 
kind of see the bigger picture one last time. You know, we'd been hovering on those last several slides on, you know, first in Maine. And uh, we just wanted to show you there's uh, quite an exciting uh, and uh, inclusive and captivating project just beyond that corner. So a central public town square that's activated and programmed per our agreements. It's a requirement that this be programmed and activated over time. So this isn't gonna be a dead commercial zone. We're gonna have events, festivals, as I mentioned earlier, surrounded by compelling local retail. Again, local retail is a requirement of our agreements with the city and county of Broomfield. So, so be cool, uh, I hope you're excited about it as well. We have these tremendous benched um, walls surrounding the lake so that uh, you can sit on these terrace steps, if you will, surrounding the lake edge and enjoy a cup of coffee, read a book, share an ice cream cone with your children, and, and uh, just really enjoy uh, the, new, the new core of Broomfield here. And we hope you'll take a stroll around the lake and, and enjoy all the amazing amenities that are on this site. Um, you know, I mentioned the beach, the boathouse. We haven't even touched on all of the amenities, though. There will be a sort of a bermed amphitheater immediately west of the library, just an additional outdoor gathering park, if you will, that can be used for public events. Um, on the north side of the multifamily residential building you're seeing there on the right side of your screen, there's um, a beer garden that's fenced in, but with views of the lake, so, so um, with a, and a large outdoor garden uh, in a true beer garden fashion where kids and parents can enjoy a beverage and a safe environment. You won't need to worry about somebody running into the lake. You're in, um, there will be a, a fence um, bordering that, that property. But it's, uh, again, this, this thing is packed full of, of little, little nuggets of, of fun. And um, I'd like to shut up for a minute and let everybody uh, maybe ask some questions, good, bad, ugly, uh, ho hopefully um, some, some questions about you know what what we hope to do with this project and uh if there's anything else that anybody else wants to touch on from the development team maybe we just open it up for that before we completely turn it over to q a but hopefully we can wrap up here pretty quick well i think um we've got some great questions this is anna burton zetti the planning director um again if you had joined us a little later um we've got some great questions started on the q a within the zoom call and I also see some hands raised. So um, let's go through some of those questions and answers, and um, then maybe we'll have an opportunity for the development team to, to add some final thoughts at the end. Um, so let's start here. Um, our first question is from a longtime resident of the area who had a question regarding the, um, there was a, a traffic study recently completed at Main Street and First Avenue, um, and there's a concern that because of COVID, the traffic counts could be impacted. Um, and for this particular resident, if you'd like to follow up with me afterwards, um, you had an additional question regarding um, why traffic studies have not been conducted in prior years. Um, and I'd be happy to follow up with you regarding that question in particular. You can send an email to planning at broomfield.org and we'll follow up with our traffic staff tomorrow. But in terms of tonight's meeting, um, let's, we, we could really, Tim, maybe you could talk about um, the traffic study that you'll be completed and, and maybe uh, whether we're in anticipating um, any types of impacts because of the COVID. Yeah, it's a great question and you're right. Um, it's unfortunate that uh, we can't go sample what would be a, a normal world out there today. Uh, for that reason, we have um, engaged the traffic consultant to pull as much historical data from prior traffic counts within this vicinity as they can. And they, they can do a pretty good job of triangulating, um, you know, using historical data coupled with projected growth where the, the current traffic counts should be if we weren't in the middle of a, you know, the COVID-19 situation. Um, but it's a, it's a great question. We've got the same, same question, same concern, and we're doing our best to address it through, again, pulling historical data um, from, from recent traffic studies that were pre-COVID. 
Thanks, Tim. And just as a quick reminder for those of you who may be calling in um, using your phone, if you would like to raise your hand in order to ask a future question, you'll want to press star nine on your phone. Or if you're in the Zoom call, you can either use the raise hand button if you'd like to uh, verbally ask your question, or you can use the Q&A button and we'll try to get as, through as many of these questions as we can this evening. So um, the next question is, how deep is the lake expected to be and does the depth dare vary um, based on location? Chris, would you be able to answer that? Sure. Is my mic on? My thing disappeared, sorry. Um, so we are actually out there um, potholing and testing where water levels are today. Um, but the design intent is that the lake would be between seven and eight feet um, in its deepest portion in the center. And it would sort of get shallower as you came up towards the plaza where we have terrace steps coming in and also shallower along the North shore and the beach. So that would sort of gradually rise up towards uh, the shore. Um, the lake is actually uh, critical and we're going to have to work closely with an ecologist because um, we're trying to get a depth that will sustain fish and, and other wildlife in the lake. Thank you. Um, maybe Chris, could you take that, the general, uh, the mixed use buildings north of the market hall? Or, it, you know, they may be asking about the two buildings that were not included in the description. Yeah, I think the ones you just circled. Yeah, sorry, I think it's these two here, yeah. Um, so, an architect has not been engaged for those buildings there, but we have done some initial studies to understand the depth of these buildings um, that could be behind the new market hall. And just to remind everyone, the market hall I'm sorry, the Safeway site, existing Safeway to site is about 15 feet higher than First Avenue. Um, so those could either be um, two to three story townhomes um, with ground floor activation along Main Street. Um, they could be small retail or even um, sort of small mixed use office, um, but it has not been uh, fully vetted yet. Thanks. Um, so the next question is back to traffic. Um, Tim, maybe you could help with this. Um, when a car is pulling out of the two exits onto Main Street, there's concern that the lights will shine onto the houses directly um, to the west. Um, and what can be done that with that? Um, and then just, again, general concern regarding traffic on Main Street. Yeah, again, it, it's a good comment. Um, there's not a ton you can do, you know, lights are lights. We will be softening up the edges of those corners with, with landscaping. So. Um, at the same time, you do have sight tri triangles, so you can't completely screen off uh, the views and pulling out of those entrances. Uh, but we'll do our best to, to use landscaping to our benefit and make sure that there's, uh, we're not spraying light um, across the entire neighborhood, but not, not a ton we can do um, when exiting that area. You know, folks do have to head west. And with that, there, there will be headlights shining west. Again, we'll use landscaping to our benefit, to our advantage. And, and make sure that it's, uh, it's minimized the, the best we can. Thank you. I think, uh, Tim, you'd also be able to answer the next question regarding timing. Um, could you review the timing for the market hall, the renovated um, Safeway building uh, versus the rest of the project around the lake? And then related to that, um, the next question is asking when local retailers would be able to contact um, regarding interest in those sites. I feel like those are a little bit related. Totally related. I'll take the first if Joe can take the second. Um, we are uh, looking at uh, 2022 as a start date for not only the Safeway building, but for the entirety of what you're seeing on the screen here. Uh, the, the, this project does need to move forward as a whole. It's instrumental to the bond financing and the viability of the project. You don't want to you don't want to be living in a, in a construction site. We don't want active construction immediately surrounding this this town square, um, we want it to, to come online as a whole. And with that, uh, again, 2022 is when we're looking for um, site of site infrastructure, lake excavation, um, pad preparation for the, the buildings you're seeing there. And then um, also beginning to dissect the Safeway building. Uh, the Safeway building will come online a little bit earlier because it's a quicker build uh, given it's an existing structure. 
uh, and then we sort of have staggered deliveries of the rest of of the rest uh, buildings you see on the screen. Again, the intent being to make it the project come online as a whole. Yeah, and and Joe Boster's jumping in here on the retailers. Where we have names of of uh, businesses that are are interested in being here already. It is a ways out in the future, of course. So it's it's difficult to you know really progress uh, a deal at this point because you know the design needs to be uh, significantly refined so we know exactly how big the spaces are, where where they are, what infrastructure they're going to have. Uh, that kind of thing but um, anyone who's interested in the space should contact uh, can contact me uh, directly via my uh, my email which is uh, j-v-o-s-t-r-e-j-s at citystreetinvestors.com and uh, we are uh, you know we're maintaining a, a list of uh, interested parties and we'll reach out to uh, anyone who's interested at the appropriate time great thank you uh, next question, will the three-story townhomes on Main have an outside appearance facing Main Street that is compatible with the homes across the street on the west side of Main? And if so, what are some of those aesthetics that you are looking at? Uh, to date, those buildings have not been designed, uh, so it's not completely dialed in yet, but that is, that is the design intention. Um, we will drive the architects to include the material palettes that are uh, prevalent in the basement uh, community to the west. So. You're looking at brick materials. There's a variety of colors of bricks ranging from you know, pinkish red to tan and first filing. And, and absolutely we'll be marrying that uh, to the aesthetic of the townhomes. And then um, it probably won't be entirely three-story brick. It probably is good to think about mixing the material palette within that building. Um, so that could be you know, some board and batten. We, we don't know. They haven't been designed yet, but um, again, just looking at uh, like the, like the resident asked, marrying those to, to the aesthetic of the neighborhood. Okay, thank you. Um, is it planned to keep the tennis courts and the community park? Yes. That's a quick one. <laughs> um, next question, is there an, a, a legit, are there legitimate reasons that First Avenue cannot be closed to cars as part of this project? And what, uh, then what pedestrian uh, safety feature will exist to ensure safety for the people as they walk from the public, public plaza to the market hall? Um, maybe I can start and um, Tim, you can jump in. Um, that's a really good question too, because we asked that at the beginning here. Um, the first and simple answer is that First Avenue must remain open because it is a primary um, fire truck and emergency route um, through that portion of the city. Um, the second answer is a little more nuanced. You know, when we started this project, we had a lot of conversations about where retail should be located. Should we do retail along First Avenue? Um, should we focus retail entirely in the market hall? Um, should we put retail more in this public plaza in the middle? And um, we all landed on, on really and to, cre to create a unique heart of the community and a public plaza. We needed all the retail on the plaza. Um, but what we found out from experience in other projects is if you close a street with retail on it to vehicles, uh, the retail has a very hard time surviving. And we've always been um, knowledgeable of the challenges of making the retail um, survive and thrive in this public plaza. So we've taken great care to design the plaza in coordination with, with the buildings um, and city streets um, user program um, to make that a viable and open space. So keeping the street open just helps keep eyes um, on that public plaza and letting people know it's there. Um, to the second point of the question, um, the safety features of the street. First Avenue today is a quite a wide street, curb to curb. Um, so we are uh, actually narrowing the curb to curb street width. I think we're 34 feet. Um, we are putting on-street parking on the street. Um, we are putting um, uh, separated sidewalks. Um, so there's planters and trees between the pedestrian zone and the cars. Um, so doing everything to sort of do a road diet and slow the traffic on the street. And then um, as far as the crossing from the um, new market hall uh, to the plaza, we, we've done a lot of thinking about that. And um, we're going to actually pinch the street even further as much as we can with curbs um, and treat that entire crossing um, 
with either the material from the plaza or scored concrete to um, denote that is a um, um, pedestrian and slow zone for vehicles. Um, we have explored the idea of even table topping that to further um, slow down vehicles, um, but that is a challenge with the um, fire and emergency vehicle access through there. All right, thank you. Uh, next question, I'm not sure who would best be able to answer this, but it's where does the water come for the new lake? That may be a question. Anna, I'll take that. Thank you. Yeah, this is Kevin Stanbridge. Uh, we're working with our public works group now. Uh, the city and county of Broomfield owns water rights that come from Denver Water, Northern Colorado, Colorado Water Conservancy District, as well as a number of ditches, agricultural ditches around the North Metro area. So we're looking at our portfolio of water now and uh, going through an analysis of which of those water rights will be, be best uh, able to uh, be put into the pond and keep the pond at a, at a, a consistent level. So uh, it will be uh, sitting County of Broomfield water and we're looking now to uh, establish which uh, uh, of those water rights we'll be putting in there. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, will there also be retail restaurants on the ground level of the, of the living spaces to the east of the plaza? Uh, yes, the, the, uh, the ground floor of the uh, all but the uh, age restricted building will have retail on the ground floor, retail and restaurants on the ground floor. Great. Um, will the age restricted building residents be for sale or for rent? For rent at this point, uh, it's still open, but it's looking likely for rent. Um, for the townhomes on Main Street, how many parking spaces will each home have? If the occupants need more parking, is there some sort of overflow besides parking on Main Street? Yeah, absolutely. This, this site uh, benefits from a tremendous amount of parking. You can see three different parking structures within the uh, views you've got here on site, two of which are open to the public. Uh, so both those multifamily residential parking structures are are open. Um, so again, overflow parking is ample and readily prevent, prevalent throughout the site. The townhomes are envisioned to be parked with two um, attached garage spaces uh, per unit. So uh, any overflow parking can, can push out. Uh, if there's guest parking needed, for instance, uh, that can push out into the, the shared parking within the multifamily residential building. Thank you. Next question was, uh, a request to please address more about the traffic for the group. Uh, so maybe you could go through, um, or I, I could even add some detail that um, if this proposal proceeds to the next step, which it will, <laughs> I'm so used to saying that for other projects, but we're working really hard on, on this project and it will be proceeding to the next steps. Um, and that part of that is a traffic study. So um, I, I think the team has described a little bit about their efforts with how they will be drafting that traffic study. And then once the application is submitted, um, the city traffic engineer will review that study um, and provide comments and feedback. Um, and then that traffic study will be utilized just through that site development plan analysis and be available um, if anyone was interested in, in reviewing it through that site development plan process. It's a, it's a public document. Um, that also helps to shape the necessary improvements for the public roadways um, that are impacted by this proposal. So um, that traffic study is a key component of that next step that we're moving towards. So then the next step or the next question is, is the lake and additional items being added truly public? It sounds like those items are more targeted to the residents of the new buildings over Broomfield uh, rather than Broomfield in general. I No, I, I think that the, the lake is to be thought of like a public park, um, completely and totally accessible to the public at all times. Um, lots of amenities there, uh, public can come and hopefully they're gonna be able to rent paddle boats and uh, come to the beach and you know hang out. We hope to stock it with fish. Completely open to the public again. Um, so yeah, I think the the correct way to think about it is entirely as a public amenity. Great. 
Yeah, and Chris, it would be helpful if you could to pan back to some of those original renderings uh, very early in the, in the project. Uh, the, the, the lake is lined with, with retail and public space. So it's, it's lined with a boardwalk with a, a tiered um, seating, bench seating arrangement around the lake. And if you can zoom to the renderings and just show the feel of what the, the connection to the lake is from the public viewpoint, maybe, maybe the next two renderings as well. Uh, to kind of show you what we're talking about. So this is very much connected to the plaza. And, uh, and again, we, we've got um, a, boardwalk, a boardwalk surrounding the plaza. Is there, can you pan to the next one past this one, Joe? Or sorry, Chris, uh, one more. There no. you go. Yeah, I mean, this, this tells the story best. Uh, this is what we're building. This is not like hypothetical renderings. This is what we've proposed. This is in our submittal. And, and uh, I think this tells the story of, of who, this is, who this is for. Thank you. Um, has there been a noise or traffic impact study completed for those who live west of Main Street? Uh, we, we hit on the traffic study earlier. Tra traffic study is underway. Uh, I think one resident mentioned they saw the, the counter out there recently. Um, we have completed a noise study. Uh, not, sh not sure. Um, I, you know, we're not envisioning uh, this, this being anything beyond, you know, the, uh, any other noise level impact from the existing community, including, you know, what, what would have been experienced at an operating grocery store uh, immediately to the south. Uh, so, you know, not certain about that noise one. So, something I don't, I don't well, know one, making, one of the things I'll add in here, Tim, this is Joe speaking again, you know, a lot of care was taken in the design of this project and the impact, uh, the input that we got through the, the focus group sessions. And that was, we wanted to create what really is sort of an enclosed space. So what you see is that where there is a higher level of activity, it's really in a sense behind walls. Um, and you know that, that did two things. One is that it's important to create, uh, when, you want, when you're trying to create a space that's very special and that people want to use and enjoy, just like you're seeing in the picture in front of you, you have to create an ambiance and a room and it's, it's a place where there can be quiet reflective moments, there can be festivals, but it's all contained within, uh, within some walls. So the, uh, the outside of the project was deliberately um, sort of quieted down, you know, to, to use that word, that it's very passive on the exterior. When you look at what's alongside uh, for, uh, Main Street in particular, the, the use of the townhomes there, um, the fact that it's all residential on that side, that there's large landscape buffers. It's really very passive, very quiet on those sides. So it was intentional to uh, keep the, um, the really commercial aspect of the project, you know, contained within an area that uh, could sort of be controlled and would contain things like noise and odors and lights. And I, I, think, I think the design largely successfully does that. Joe. All right, thank you. Um, next question is um, a little bit more detail on how you'll ensure that traffic and parking is not overflowing into first filing. Uh, you've mentioned a little bit about the um, available parking spaces within the garage, but uh, maybe going into parking estimates and um, anything else that you might think uh, would help to describe your efforts to not allow um, overflow parking. Yeah, the, the traffic consultants do consider um, the nodes of activity and they you know, generate anticipated trips from the types of uses within the project. And um, those traffic studies use the nodes and times of day at, at which trips would be generated for the anticipated uses. And, and that all flows into data and, and that data uh, will inform us. Again, that study's underway. Uh, again, we'll be working with the with the city and county to to make sure that you know, we're not detrimentally impacting the surrounding community, uh, but from just the the thirty thousand foot view, uh, we we do hope this is a draw from the surrounding community, 
and there is an existing arterial street grid uh, around this site. So, so we are going to take advantage of what we've got with, with Main Street and 120th right there. Yeah, and, and, and I would add here, Tim, that, you know, that the Safeway store has not been in operation for some years now, but was a significant traffic generator in its own right. And it's also, I think, important to remember that this uh, site at First in Maine has really been intended as a development site. Um, you know, going back decades. And, you know, it, it has been uh, largely a green field uh, for those ensuing decades, but there was inevitably going to be some development on this site. As Kevin mentioned earlier, it was originally going to be a hospital, which would, as you, as you can imagine, would have generated its own traffic and, uh, uh, you know, noise and parking con considerations. So we've tried to be as careful as we can in this project to keep things contained. This is why you see the parking garages are all wrapped within buildings, so you really can't even see them. Um, and the parking is really generous. We, you know, just uh, coincidentally, um, you know, received a letter from a stakeholder in Boulder, or I'm sorry, in Broomfield, bemoaning the fact that we had so much parking, you know, that felt like that there needed to be more emphasis on uh, making sure that people used alternate modes of transportation for the project. but. It is a generously parked project as it needs. To, we feel like it's prudent from an investment standpoint um, to make sure that we have adequate parking and, and we're hyper aware of the, uh, that the community really wants to make sure that the impact of um, motor vehicles, both moving and parked, um, has, you know, a tolerable, uh, is maintained at a tolerable level. Uh, so that has been our intention all along. And we think that the design um, and the considerations that we've taken have have addressed that, uh, you know, as successfully as we can hope to. Thank you. Um, and just a reminder for those of you who may have called in, it is star nine to ask a question. I think I'll go through two more questions in the Q&A and then I'm going to switch over. I know we've got two um, raised hands um, for Zoom callers. We'll go to those before we go back to the written Q&As. Um, so just an opportunity, if you are on the phone and want to ask a question, uh, the time now would be to press star nine. Um, so uh, quickly going over back to the Q&A for two more. The first is um, that this is the first that they had heard that the lake water will be maintained so people can swim in it. Um, is that a recent change? And could you describe the, um, is that a sand beach depicted in the renderings near the tennis court? Uh, not a recent change. Yeah, we, uh, the beach has been there. Uh, geez. Um, for at least nine months. I don't know if it's been there, you know, going back iterations two, three years ago. Uh, but yeah, the, uh, the, the quality of the lake has always been paramount uh, to us. And uh, so we always envisioned this would be a high quality um, amenity we if we didn't have a beach we were in, intending residents to be kayaking and paddle boarding um within the lake regardless and and so this is uh again very rare to have that amenity it, it, i have kids you know it, it's hard to take it's hard to find a place that's safe for your kids to swim especially come june july and august when it gets even warmer um, so a, a swimmable lake uh, with a safe beach is, is pretty rare and we think a huge amenity to the project. And, and I'll just add a uh, clarification. Um, Kevin Stanbridge, Deputy City and County Manager, had talked a little bit about the efforts for the water sources for the lake. Um, and the ability to swim in the water will um, be a little driven by the final design, the sources for the water. Um, and, I think, um, as Tim was saying, definitely our goal is to have this um, water that is capable of being swimmed in, even if um, in the end we are not able to allow public um, to actually swim within the water. Um, but that is something that we would have to um, consider going forward with the sources of the water um, in the final design. Is that, that fair to say, Tim or Chris? It is. Uh, you know, Anna, can I just add something to that? The lake. Um, wasn't uh, just didn't come out of uh, you know our heads a lake to be a lake it came from our research into the history of Broomfield and how sort of the farmers pond um, you know a century ago or, and even before first filing were really where the community gathered playing in the water fishing in the water dogs in the water 
Um, so we were trying to sort of harken back to the history of Broomfield and, um, you know, modernize the experience of people gathering on the lake. Including on this property, uh, formerly a, a reservoir. All right, thank you. One more and then we'll go to the questions uh, on the, the Zoom. Um, why are there so many apartments and townhomes um, with a concern that, of this driving up congestion on the streets? You know, I'll, I'll address that. The, you know, this was an issue that was the subject of lengthy, lengthy conversation back when, when we were doing the focus groups with the community. And the, you know, the, the outcome of that was really that in order for this to be a genuine, authentic town square, um, it has to have some density. And uh, in order for it to be economically successful, as well as being vibrant and really offer everything that the community wanted from this, um, it, it was really essential that there be people there. I mean, it, it, this is a place for people. Um, and so we need, uh, you know, we need to have places for people to live. We need to have places for people to work. Uh, to shop, uh, you know, and, and to eat and to make it a place where you want to linger. I mean, that was the big thing that came out of the focus groups is that, uh, you know, there needed to be a heart for Broomfield. And, you know, we're, this, this is the vision that the community asked for was that, that, that we be given a, a, you know, a geographical heart. And it's very difficult to, uh, you know, create that, that heart and that level of vibrancy you know, that makes it so special if there is a lack of density. You know, the, the Broomfield is blessed with a lot of open space and a lot of parks, but what it doesn't have is that, you know, that central, that central gathering place, that heart, that, that thing that, that people say there's a, there's a there there, you know, where a community knows where its, its central core is. And the density is an essential part of that. And uh, you know, I will tell you that the participants, the stakeholders, the residents and the business owners who, uh, you know, generously contributed their time to those focus groups really struggled with this question of density and, and understood ultimately that in order to have the kind of, you know, vibrant town square that they wanted, they understood that, you know, the density was uh, not only necessary, but ultimately desirable. Great, thank you. Um, so we have two callers, um, or actually two Zoom attendants with their hands raised, and I'll ask our um, IT staff to also help us with this. Jake, if you can help us ensure that um, perhaps St. John, uh, last name, could you ask your question? Um, I think you'll need to bring yourself off mute if you can hit the microphone button. Okay. And it looks like they did just lower their hand. Okay, if we can go to, um, it looks like name is Craig with a hand raised. And again, you'll need to take yourself off mute to speak. Craig, do you want to try and ask your question? Your microphone, I see, is working. Looks like we're not able to hear you. Um, if you can type in your question in the Q&A, um, I'll look for that and try to answer it next. Thank you. Going back uh, to our written questions, um, how many people, um, in terms of new residents and cars, uh, would be added to this space, to this small space? I have a rough estimate of, um, you know, as, as designed with the three res, uh, three larger residential buildings you saw on the plan, we've got about 480 residences, um, and then also the townhomes, so about 480 residences with that. You do get slightly less than two two people per household in attached residential product. Um, so with that, somewhere more than 500 
um, less than a thousand, probably closer to a thousand and five hundred. So maybe talking, you know, eight fifty nine hundred residents in in this first phase. Thank you. Will any of the multifamily residential units be available for purchase? At this point, the the three residential buildings you see surrounding the lake on your screen are uh, for rent. Uh, we do envision uh, additional residences within this area, particularly immediately east and immediately south of there you're looking at here, uh, which will have additional for sale product. Um, what about the residents on Main Street? Will they have a permit or something to retain parking spaces in front of the homes? And I think that's a question that staff can help answer. Um, Brimfield does have areas that, that permit parking has been um, initiated. Um, that would be a process um, separate from the development process. And we can certainly talk you through that process if you'd like to reach out at Brimfield. I'm sorry, planning at brimfield.org and we can um, follow up with you regarding what that process is um, in the future. Um, next question is, um, if First Avenue is closed to cars and drivers are rerouted to 120th Avenue and Lamar, then the impact of headlights and noise on first filing is mitigated. Why not do that? Well, I know from a master planning perspective, uh, it was very difficult to have, um, you can see development to the north. Um, if you wanted to bring traffic uh, all the way down to First Street, you, it'd be very difficult to accomplish while also surrounding the central town plaza with, with buildings. So the intention is to frame this plaza with buildings to make it more of your European town square effect and um, it's, it's a tight site. There's, there's only so much you can do. And we've, Civitas looked at, at several iterations and did their best to, to rack a lot of exciting stuff within, within this small area. And, and uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the feeding everything from the north down south over to First Avenue was, was, not, was not viable. All right, thank you. Um, this resident thought they heard in a previous meeting that there was a plan to have a boutique hotel at first in Maine. Is that still planned or has it been scrapped? Yeah, we ultimately determined that that, that use was, was not gonna be viable. And so looking at the site plan on the screen right now, you can see building D in that location, which is a mixed residential use building. All right, thank you. Um, what impact does the construction and the completed plans have on local wildlife? Should be to the positive. Again, we're uh, trying to create an ecosystem with the lake here um, that will include natural vegetated wetlands, naturally vegetated wetlands. Um, the existing drainage channel will be improved right now. It's more of a trickle channel with you know, grass kind of abutting a couple boulders uh, that will uh, improve to include, uh, you know, the grass, tall grass, et cetera. As well as, as that wraps towards what you see is identified as L, the existing pond over there. Additional um, wildlife, uh, you know, with, with wetlands and, and, and uh, riparian habitat in that area. And we mentioned earlier G, the intention of the lake labeled G have a, a very high quality um, body of water that supports fish and, and other wildlife. Uh, being an avid fisherman, something I'm very excited about is making sure this lake is, um, you know, maintained well and, and, and a healthy habitat. Hey, Tim, this is Kevin Stambert. You're going to want to jump in on that. So there will be a part of the development review process in Broomfield. There is a wildlife assessment that's completed for each site. So we'll do the assessment. Look to see uh, if necessary, if we can relocate wildlife, uh, we would be looking at that first. And as Tim mentioned, uh, the area at the northwest corner of the site, uh, up near the drainage way is where you'll see an emphasis on the natural areas. Uh, we've talked about, can we do plantings 
and other vegetation to encourage uh, birds, aviary um, area uh, focus on that. And the other thing we, we also haven't talked about yet is we're doing what we can around the design of the edge of the waterway uh, to make it unattractive to geese. So by having hard edges and not having get grass transition into the water body, uh, we want to make the area as uninviting as we can for the geese population. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, the next question is, are you planning on making Main Street four lanes now with all the apartments? They are not looking forward to the traffic and want to know if, sorry, if 120th Avenue will be expanded to six lanes to handle the extra flow of traffic. Uh, why don't, this is Kevin again, I'll just jump on that. So there are no plans to make First Avenue, or excuse me, Main Street four lanes. Uh, we were very deliberate years ago and we pushed the traffic lanes on Main Street over to the east side of the roadway to provide the parking along the west side uh, for the residents. So there are no plans to uh, make Main Street four, street four lanes. And we are, our engineering staff is now working on a project to add two lanes to West 120th Avenue from Main Street over to the new underpass uh, about where 287 goes off to the northwest there. So we, and we're also looking at adding sidewalks along 120th Avenue as well. As you probably know, 120th Avenue is a state highway, so we'll work with the Colorado Department of Transportation on that, and that is one of our ongoing activities. Thank you. Thank you. The next question um, is going to be, how will this project be paid for? And who is, is paying for the project? Yeah, it's uh, a combination of bond financing and uh, private uh, financing. Um, there's uh, the town has approved a uh, redevelopment and reimbursement agreement to support uh, the tax increment finance package that supports some of the public improvements you see within the area. Necessary uh, infrastructure improvements, any offsite improvements, uh, landscaping within the right of way, the public plaza even the lake improvements, again, all supported in part with a tax revenue sharing agreement um, with the, the city and county as approved by the Urban Renewal Authority. And, uh, but, but predominantly um, the lion's share of this project is, is supported purely by private investments. So these are uh, uh, strong um, prospects for um, attracting capital and we, you know, we're, we're very um, involved in, in, the, in the capital market space and financing space, both City Street investors, as well as Millinder White, and uh, full confidence in the ability to, to capitalize uh, the, the project you see in front of you here tonight. And again, it's a, it's a combination of bond financing, which is backed by the revenue stream, which includes tax increment finance, as well as uh, the, the, the income that comes from the business improvement district and metropolitan district within this property. Uh, again, backing a bond sale to, to, to complete the public improvements. And then the rest of everything that basically you see above ground uh, is, is privately financed. Yeah, and just to, to throw just a bit more color on that, the, to make sure everyone understands how the tax increment financing works and, and the bond uh, the metro district bonds work is that currently we have a site that is not generating any tax revenue at all. It's, it's not paying property taxes, nor is it paying, uh, is, are any sales taxes being generated? Um, as you know, it's a vacant lot. The Safeway building is vacant, so there is no taxes being generated at all. What the tax increment financing does is it permits the new taxes, the brand new taxes, both property taxes and sales taxes, they're going to be generated from this project, which will be significant. Um, those new taxes will essentially be committed to paying for some of the public improvements. So the lakes and the plazas, the stuff that is really public, publicly accessible. The Metro District has some similarities to it. The Metro District is basically the property owner here, in essence, taxing themselves in order to generate um, is in order to generate funds. So in addition to the conventional property taxes that will be paid here, there'll be an add-on property tax, a metro district tax, if you will. And that tax, uh, the, that tax revenue will fund the repayment of bonds that were issued to help finance 
uh, again, uh, infrastructure uh, for the project. And then on top of that, there will be private equity, our own money, basically, the investors' uh, money, and then bank financing. So that those are really the components of uh, what goes into financing the project. Thanks. Looks like we got a few follow-up questions regarding that. So I'm just going to read them off and maybe you can help clarify. Um, the questions were, could you clarify about what a tax sharing revenue agreement is, what a tax increment advance is, and whether first filing is included in the Metro District you just mentioned? Yeah, so the first filing is not included in the Metro District. The, the Metro District is limited to just the, what you see on the site. So it's only the new stuff that, that's being developed. There won't be a you know, there won't be an, any additional taxes for anybody outside of this site. It's purely in an internal tax, if you if you think it, uh, if you think of it that way. Back to answering the question about the, the the tax revenue sharing, I think I answered that in the last question. But to reiterate, uh, there are no taxes being generated now. This project, once it's built and we have restaurants open and stores open and people living there, will be paying both property taxes and generating brand new sales taxes, which uh, will be new revenue for the city and county of Broomfield. Uh, the idea is, is that for some period of time, a portion of those taxes will help go to pay for public improvements uh, to, uh, to the site. Okay, thank you. Um, next question was, um, the, is the pond being stocked for fishing uh, catch and release purposes? Well, Tim and I are both avid fishermen, and where we really, really want to see this, uh, see this, this lake be able to sustain a uh, population of game fish. Um, you know, the the like. Uh, let's hope that we can actually have a, a self-sustaining population in there, and and but likely likelihood is we'll have to stock it including, you know, possibly being able to stock a uh, catchable trout in the spring. I don't know that trout will be able to sustain themselves at these temperatures year round, but um, like a lot of lakes around uh, the Denver metro area, trout are sometimes stocked in the, in the spring, which are uh, people can actually keep when they catch them. So the regulations around uh, the fishing in here, I think are gonna have to be uh, determined but we, we certainly want to make sure that that recreational opportunity is available here, if it's at all possible. As you know, as indicated in previous comments, there's a lot of work to be done on this yet, <clears throat> but the team, both the, the, the development team and the city team are committed to, uh, you know, trying to make the, you know, the reality of <clears throat> uh, all the amenities that everybody wants from this body of water a reality. Thank you. And I'll just take a, a quick moment. I, I've seen a, a few of our attendees have dropped off. I know we're getting closer to 7.30. Um, our effort will be to get um, answers to the last questions that we're seeing here. Um, but if you're not able to um, continue on with the meeting or you've got um, a few more follow-up questions that you'd like to ask, um, you're also available, um, able to submit additional questions through the Broomfield Voice, which is broomfieldvoice.com, or you're welcome to send an email to the planning division, and that's at planning at broomfield.org, and we'll work on getting you um, some answers to those questions. Uh, the Broomfield Voice will continue to be a great resource for the neighbors um, moving forward. Um, Lynn Merwin in our office, principal planner, will continue to update that website with key dates, um, revised plans as they're submitted, um, so that's a great resource uh, for you to follow along if you're interested in um, continuing to be involved in, the, in this project. Uh, next question, also about the lake, we've got kind of two you could answer. Um, first, are, are motorized vehicles going to be allowed on the lake and is it possible for ice skating in the winter? Well, I'll, I'll take a shot at those. The only motorized vehicles we could envision at this point would be maybe some remote control uh, speedboat toys or something like that. Um, I don't think any kind of a, you know, motorized fishing boat or anything like that would be appropriate on the lake. So we certainly don't envision that. Um, uh, the, uh, the ice thing, I, you know, this has come up a lot. A lot of people have asked this question and I, I, I suspect that we're going to have difficulty getting, uh, the ice thickness that we need in order to, you know, really have um, ice skating here, but uh, that remains to be seen. I think there's a lot of work 
engineering work that, and planning work that needs to be done on this little body of water. It's a, it's a very special thing, but it's also very complicated. Um, and as uh, enticing as uh, that sounds, there, there may be some, some real obstacles to you know, making, that, uh, re uh, making that a reality. So we'll stay tuned on that, but because it's, it's certainly gonna be part of the discussion on, on what happens here. Thank you. Um, the next one is uh, a concern regarding traffic um, and asking if you could move forward with just the markets and the shops without any housing as part of the proposal. I'm happy to, to start if somebody else wants to complete my thought, if I leave anything out, but um, that's, that's been tried before with commercial shopping centers and, and those types of shopping centers um, sometimes work, sometimes don't. Uh, oftentimes they are dark uh, and feel like a commercial shopping center. And, and what we were challenged to do here with this site is to create a, two, a true gathering spot in the heart of Broomfield and, um, with, with strictly commercial districts. Typically the lights turn off at a certain time and they turn on at a certain time and any, any time in between it's dark, there's no activation. Uh, it's typically just, it feels, and comes off like a shopping center. And you can probably imagine the types of places I'm, I'm talking about right now. I'm not gonna name names, but uh, there's several in and around Broomfield. And those were envisioned as commercial only uh, town centers. And time and again, it's proven that it doesn't create the type of atmosphere, atmosphere that, that we've been challenged to create here. Great, thank you. Um, the next is regarding um, flooding in the area and drainage. Where will, the, um, where will the water go if the lake floods? As each year, the heavy rains bring flooding to the nearby drainage areas. So how will that be addressed through your design? Hey, this is Kevin Stambridge. Let me just jump in for a quick second on that if I could. Um, the question refers to uh, the inclination of the park on the north side to flood now under uh, heavy rains, and that was actually designed to do that. The area on the north side of the park leading into Community Park Pond, just on the north side of the library, um, as you'll see in the summertime, especially when we get those fast, hard, late afternoon rains, that area floods as it's designed to. Um, part of the developer's uh, engineering uh, efforts in this is to uh, recreate that or continue uh, with the stormwater detention of that area uh, on the north side, and then it will pass the water through uh, on the north of Community Park Pond where it'll go underneath Spader Way uh, and off into the drainage way that goes uh, down to 120th Avenue and uh, goes under 120th Avenue. So the stormwater will be accommodated on the property and it will continue to accommodate the stormwater that comes in from first filing. Thanks, Tim. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Overflow is connected to the regional um, stormwater system. Thank you. Um, will the parking be free? At this point, it is anticipated to be free. That said, um, there's pros and cons for charging or not charging. Uh, I saw that another comment uh, noting that, you know, free parking and, and over parking sites does encourage uh, automobile behavior and you know, are you, are you exacerbating traffic problems by encouraging folks to, to drive their SUVs to this site? So it does take some, it will take some thought and consideration to, is there an appropriate fee for parking to, you know, make sure that uh, not only is the parking being maintained and, and, and the bonds are being supported. That was another great comment I saw is, is something we looked at, you know, parking revenue can go to support the bonds to pay for the public improvements on this site. Great thought. We have looked into it. It is a consideration. This time our preference is to, to keep it free, though uh, I do not believe uh, our team has made an ultimate decision on, on which way to go. Uh, additionally, it may change with time. So it, uh, we may begin by testing the waters, seeing if it works or doesn't um, as free parking. And uh, if, you know, uh, fees can, can use as a behavior modification tool as well. So that's... Uh, Something that can change over time, and, and and I would add to that that one of the you know one of the primary challenges in you know realizing the vision of the citizens in this project uh, was uh, making sure that we could 
have financially sustainable local independent businesses. And, you know, that's the desire for everyone for this project. And so, you know, we need to balance, um, you know, all of the things that Tim was just talking about with making sure that our local merchants here are successful. And so our inclination is for this parking to be free um, as a way of ensuring that, that, those, that those local merchants had every chance of, of success. Um, but as Tim said, it's something that we're going to have to evaluate uh, over time and try and make, you know, smart decisions about uh, what to do there. Thank you. Um, what efforts are being made in regards to um, green and sustainable features for the plan? Um, and I'll just ask our attendees to focus their response. We've got it. Well, it's about 7.30 now, and I want to make sure we get through um, the questions that we have left. Um, but if you could maybe hit some of the high level um, green and sustainability elements, that would be great. Thank you. Yep, we're at, uh, with the building design, we're at the stage we call conceptual design right now. So the footprints feel pretty good. Uh, we've thought through the, the, the flow of the buildings, um, the servicing of the buildings, parking access, unit counts and unit mixes, et cetera. Uh, we haven't gone into the design stage. So with respect to, you know, what, it, what energy efficiency is the building going to command? Um, will it be pursuing lead? Uh, will there be renewable energy on site? Those are concepts that we haven't um, progressed to yet. I can say as an organization, I believe both City Street Investors and Miller White both feel strongly about sustainability. Um, for instance, Miller White is actively um, closing financing on uh, a half million dollar solar installation on one of our projects. So uh, we believe uh, in renewable energy. We believe in sustainability. It's something that will be pursued for this project. It's just very, very early in the project. So there's no definition of when and or how and where that's going to happen. Um, but it, it is one of our design intents. Great. Thank you. Uh, the next question, I, I believe, is really for Brimfield staff, so I'm going to ask Lynn Merwin to respond. Um, this is, to what extent can citizens still influence this plan? Hi, yes, this is Lynn. Um, so, as Anna mentioned earlier, um, there is a project page for the Broomfield Town Square on the uh, Broomfield Voice at broomfield.org. And um, as the planning and land use applications come in later this year, we're expecting them towards the end of the year from the development team. Um, those will be put on the Broomfield Voice for folks to review. And um, the, all the engineering studies and environmental reports will be put on there. Um, the, projects will continue, the project will be noticed um, much as it was for this neighborhood meeting with um, signs and um, a newspaper ad and mailings and through those venues you can continue to participate send comments to planning at broomfield.org or comment in the voice um, so there's still multiple opportunities to participate and share your thoughts thank you great um, will the existing businesses like the pizza dry cleaners o'reilly's around the old safeway still be there or will those spaces now be worked into the central market and the food hall those spaces are currently under separate ownership. Um, the uh, city and county currently only uh, owns the Safeway building um, in the center. So those buildings that you see, those ancillary buildings that you see off to the, to the west and to the east and on the corner there, those are uh, under separate ownership. What we, what we would like to do is to, uh, as we get closer to, to uh, moving forward on the uh, construction on the Safeway building is we really like to work with that ownership group to um, make improvements to the site that in that incorporate those buildings. So new facades, new signage, new landscaping, you know, things that we can do to enhance the overall appearance of, of that shopping center. But important to note that uh, is entirely separate independent ownership. Thank you. Uh, next question was a pedestrian bridge considered across First Avenue. And I'll take that. Um, as part of this project, this is Kevin Sandbridge, it was not. Um, we have um, the resources we have, we've really focused uh, within the um, the activity area and the, the community center gathering point we're trying to create. Uh, longer term, we have a number of years out uh, proposed 
uh, great separated crossing of West 120th Avenue. Um, so we will be looking at it, but but not immediately. Uh, we'll note that throughout the plan, the uh, provision of bike and pedestrian access uh, within the development and from first filing, Highland Park and other neighborhoods is an emphasis of the project. So uh, we'll be looking to get people out of their cars as much as they can and into the area uh, as bicycle and bicyclists and pedestrians. Thank you. Great. Um, next question was, again, a, a quick clarification regarding the Metro District that you mentioned. Uh, the question was whether um, which filing this new Metro District would be included in for voter registration and city council representation. Um, so just reiterating, this is independent of adjacent residences. Um, the next question was that this uh, a comment that this uh, reminded them of old Fort Collins. Um, and if the lake was not viable for ice skating, a smaller area could be um, used for this and may continue with the cold, um, helping bring people out for the cold months. So more of a comment. Uh, next question was, how are they going to handle the increased crime and homeless transient populations which exist in this area? Um, so how have those issues been addressed or will they be addressed? Yeah, I, th I think again, urban planning principles uh, include activation of space. And so um, activating space has not been shown as, as an attractor of, of transient populations. Um, activating uh, vacant parks does um, bring, especially if, if there's home, both residents that are living there that own their homes and rent their homes, uh, a general urban planning principle shows that uh, uh, these types of environments are are kind of the opposite. Um, they, they push away those those types of atmospheres. So if, if you've got a shopkeeper uh, that is a small small local shopkeeper and it's a locally owned business and they and they potentially live in the residence above, uh, they're not going to stand for you know um, you know for instance panhandling in, in the town plaza. Whereas what you, what you've got right now is a vacant uh, commercial shopping center. And th those are the types of atmospheres that, that do, do attract, you know, transients and, 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 and those sorts of activities. Great, thank you. Um, since the buildings are, since the tall buildings are close to um, First Avenue and Main Street, um, have the privacy of those residents been concerned? How tall are the buildings that are proposed? Um, I believe along First Avenue and Main Street would likely be the concern. Yeah, on Main Street, you've got uh, the three-story townhomes and uh, the building you see labeled D, D there is four stories. So four stories would probably put you somewhere between 40 and 45 feet tall. Um, short answer, again, top story being set back somewhat on building D. Additionally, um, I would like to note that uh, all of those buildings there are set back, essentially half a football field from the homes to the west. Uh, so this isn't uh, a narrow right-of-way. Uh, it's, a, it's a wide right of way as it stands, and those buildings are set back additionally a significant distance from, from the beginning of the right of way, doing everything we can to try to mitigate the impact of the height of those buildings. Great, thank you. And our last question this evening is that our, the Arista project is about a mile away um, and requires crossing multiple highways, which is really only safe by car. So how will the citizens of the Arista neighborhood be connected to the new town center project? Um, yeah, through the existing travel network, I, you know, the flyover, the fly under is a tremendous uh, benefit to modern 20 and uh, the connectivity to the, to the western side of 36 has only gotten better uh, with that improvement. So, not sure how to direct so, it. Tim, Kevin Stanbridge, let me jump in just a sec. As I mentioned, we are uh, working on, actively on a project to get sidewalks along uh, West 120th Avenue from Main Street to tie into uh, the uh, improvements we made um, moving over to the Arista neighborhood. Uh, the council members uh, for that ward are also uh, really looking at uh, what are some of the additional crossings we might be able to make uh, over the railroad tracks between original Broomfield 
and uh, this area. So there are a number of other projects we're looking at trying to strengthen those connections. Uh, some have suggested the possibility of shuttles and other things like that. Um, you have to, the, the cost is pretty substantial. You'd have to have pretty high ridership. So we'll continue to look at it. But uh, for the, the shorter term, it's really improving the pathways and sidewalks uh, in this area of the community to tie Arista into the uh, Broomfield Town Square. Thanks. All right. Um, and I wanted to say one more time thank you for all the residents who took the time this evening um, to learn more about this project and, and share your thoughts and ask your questions about the project. Um, as Lynn had mentioned earlier, the Broomfield Voice will continue to be a great source of information for you. Um, she'll be updating that website as we receive new plans when the formal application is submitted. Um, we'll be sharing all portions of the application, um, so you'll, it'll be available right on that website for you. Um, you can also share comments directly through that website, and uh, Lynn monitors that site. Um, you can also share comments or ask questions at planning at broomfield.org, um, and that it goes to our planning division for Broomfield. Um, and we'd be happy to follow up on questions if you um, weren't able to have your question answered this evening or just needed a little bit more information. So uh, thank you again and thank you to the development team for um, hosting this meeting this evening um, and sharing uh, more about the project. Yeah, thank, thank you and thank the, the community. I mean, that was a, a tremendous outpouring of, of uh, Q&A there. I mean, I think we answered 53 questions I see here. So keep the feedback coming. It only improves the process and the project. And, and again, th thank you all for, for attending tonight. Yes, th thanks everyone. And, I, and again, a, a big thank you to um, you know the city who's been a very careful and deliberate uh, pro uh, partner in this project and uh, holding us accountable and, and making sure that uh, we uh, do our jobs and, and deliver a, a great project uh, to the community. So thanks everyone for their interest. We're gonna to continue to work hard on this project and uh, make it the very best it can be. Thank you all, have a good evening. Thanks everyone.